Thank you for joining us for part one of our series, Connecting Citizen Science with Remote Sensing. My name is Andrew McCollum, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Juan Torres Perez and Brittany Boudry for this session. We are also looking forward to our multiple guest speakers joining us for sessions two and three, where we will highlight citizen science projects that use Earth observations. For this training, we have three sessions, each being one and a half hours long on January 24th, 26th, and 31st. This is a bilingual training where we will present the same material in English at 11 to 12.30 Eastern time, and then again in Spanish at 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. Here's the course website where you can find all the materials, including the recordings, to watch via YouTube. Here you will also see the presentation materials and eventually a link to the homework, which will be provided during session three. At the end of each session, we will have a question and answer portion where we will display your questions and tra transcribe the answers on a document. We will make that document available on the course website about a week after the session is complete. If you have additional questions, you can email myself, Juan, or Brittany at our email addresses here. There is one homework assignment to complete for this course, and this will be submitted via Google Forms. As with most RSEC courses, the homework will become available on the last day of the training, January 31st. You will then have two weeks to complete the online homework um, until February 14th. To obtain a certificate of completion, you will need to attend the live webinars and then submit the homework by the due date. If you attend all the sessions and complete the homework by the deadline, you'll receive a certificate of completion. And please be patient with us as we have many, many people um, joining and receiving certificates. So they take a couple of months to process. Um, so you'll receive the certificate about two to three months after the course is complete. Here's the course outline. As mentioned, we will have three sessions. In this first session, I will provide an overview of citizen science. In the second session, we will review examples of water resources and coastal ocean applications of citizen science. And in the third session, we will review examples of land applications of citizen science. By the end of this training, we hope you all will be able to outline key aspects of citizen science projects, including community engagement and effective communication, motivations, ethics, and policies, data quality assurance and accessibility, and be able to summarize applications of Earth observations for citizen science, as we will highlight many case studies that use examples of Earth observations for citizen science applications. Here is the session one agenda. As mentioned, we will first review broadly what citizen science is and discuss some of the benefits and limitations. We'll also review motivations, ethics, and policies for citizen science. We'll also discuss data collection, management, usability, and accessibility. And then we'll highlight a couple tools and platforms for citizen science projects. For a little context within NASA's Applied Sciences program is our capacity building program. And RCET is one of these three core programs. Um, we also have the DEVELOP program, which is a workforce development program where participants work on 10 week interdisciplinary projects with a partner. And then SEVERE, our partnership with NASA and USAID, which helps countries use satellite data to address their challenges. And so I mentioned this because all of these programs have strong community ties. We have other efforts within capacity building at NASA centered around community action. And within this portfolio, we have the Indigenous Peoples Initiative. And we also have efforts centered around equity, environmental justice, as well as um, prizes and challenges. And so many of these efforts co-develop community-based solutions to address the challenges using NASA data. 
And while they're not specifically uh, citizen science projects, they have this strong community engagement and broad audience. So I wanted to mention some of these other efforts going on within NASA's capacity building program as well. So as a review, um, for some of you who might not be familiar with our RSET program, um, we offer online and in-person trainings on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods, and tools. All of the courses are freely available and open to anyone, and all of the content is archived and accessible after each training is over. And many of our trainings, like this one, are bilingual, offered in English and Spanish. However, all of our training materials are translated into Spanish as well, even if we don't have a um, sort of live Spanish session. And we offer trainings in many other application areas like disasters, health and air quality, water resources, and climate. So you can check out the RSET website for many, many other um, courses related to topics you might be interested in. I also wanted to highlight NASA's Citizen Science for Earth Systems program, which is focused on developing and implementing projects harness contributions from members of the general public to advance our understanding of Earth as a system. This program advances the use of citizens' contributions to Earth science research by directly supporting citizen science activities and by deploying technology to further citizen science involvement in research. This program complements NASA's ability to observe Earth from space. Also, it improves our ability to in observe things like land, air, and water by engaging the public in a mission to drive advances in science, technology, aeronautics, space exploration, economic vitality, and stewardship of the Earth. NASA citizen science projects are collaborations between scientists and interested members of the public. Through these collaborations, volunteers have helped make thousands of important scientific discoveries. More than 410 NASA citizen scientists have been named as co-authors on, ref on reference sub scientific publications. At the Citizen Science Projects at NASA website, which you can see here, you can check out one of the 32 projects. NASA citizen science projects are open to everyone around the world and are not limited to US citizens or residents. Throughout this training, we will be highlighting some of these projects, such as floating forest, NemoNet, Fjord Fido, lake observations by citizen scientists, soundscapes to landscapes, fresh eyes on ice, and two applications of the globe observer, the mosquito habitat mapper and land cover. So stay tuned for more on these exciting projects during sessions two and three of this training. Okay, so now let's jump into an overview of citizen science. Citizen science is when the public, typically non-experts, participate in scientific research. This is a form of open collaboration in which individuals or organizations participate voluntarily in the scientific process in various ways. This can include formulating research questions, conducting scientific experiments, collecting and analyzing data, interpreting results, making new discoveries, developing technologies and applications, and solving complex problems. Citizen science projects can come from just about anywhere, including federal agencies, universities, private organizations, and more. There are many ways for citizen scientists to participate in ongoing research, such as in-person, virtual, and hybrid projects. All federal agencies, including NASA, are granted authority to do citizen science by the Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act of 2016. I also want to take a moment to recognize that there are many terms used in this discipline, and the terms will vary depending on the audience and the project. And these terms can be contentious and have been highly debated. While this training does not set out to explain the nuances of these terms or to offer specific definitions, we do recognize that language matters. And at the core of this work includes an exploration of what we can learn from each other 
and that we can do science better together. Citizen science is also diverse in terms of people, places, research disciplines, questions asked, data collected, tools used, and technology applied. The key points are to have integrity in research and integrity in engagement, and to make research acceptable, relevant, and meaningful for all of those involved. And so we will discuss some of these features in a little bit more depth over the next few slides. There are many benefits of citizen science, of which I've already named a few. It can be a cost-effective way to gather data and conduct scientific research. A large group of citizen scientists can collect more data than a single scientist or research team. And participating in a citizen science program can involve public interest in science and research. And there are varied benefits depending on if the experience is in person or virtual. In-person participation creates an opportunity to spend time outdoors and can also lead to improved physical fitness of the volunteers. And then virtual participation can also sometimes better align with participants' availability and schedules. I also want to note that there are limitations in citizen science. It's important that the research teams ensure that there are resources for training for the citizen scientists, but also for the researchers in terms of how to properly engage with communities. There's also time and resources needed for recruitment and sustained engagement. It's also important to note that there can be barriers to entry for folks to become engaged in these activities and then there are also similar demographics of citizen scientists. Participants in citizen science activities are typically well-educated and working in a job that provides income and working conditions for leisure time and to have access to the internet as well as a smartphone. And so this can oftentimes lead to imbalances in gender participation or participation in terms of income and education. Researchers must also understand that much of the data collection is out of the direct control of the researchers. And there are many different techniques that can be used to ensure validation and accuracy is addressed. And we'll talk about a, a few of those later. Another important consideration is res ensuring respectful and reciprocal relationships and adhering to community engagement principles and having transparency in how the data are collected and used um, to ensure correctness, completeness, and um, also understanding that data that's submitted may be incorrect or incomplete or have duplicates. So a thorough review process for data is also essential. So here are a few common things to consider when choosing to conduct a citizen science project. This comes from an, uh, an outline of a few common things to consider. Uh, this conceptual model is available in a 2014 article produced by the Scottish Environment Protection Agency and the Center for Ecology and Hydrology. So you can access this document in the link here. In this work, the team outlines that citizen science is at its best when there is a clear scientific question being addressed. It also highlights that engagement is another important component of citizen science, but engagement in its own is not citizen science. A key question to ask is, can you extend your engagement activity into meaningful and relevant citizen science, or should you simply undertake engagement for its own sake? It's also important to consider what resources will be required to run your initiative effectively. Will you need a website? Will you need an online database? Um, do you have the technology to meet those kinds of needs? Citizen science is particularly effective at addressing questions that require large-scale approaches, especially across large spatial scales. Um, so it, it can be costly to obtain data um, over really large areas. So thinking about a long-term approach um, and having volunteers that are really committed is, is important as well. And simplicity is another key to success for mass participation of um, folks within citizen science projects. 
As the complexity of the protocol increases, the number of participants is likely to decrease, even though the value of the data may increase. So um, finally, it's important to consider people's motivations. So people will get involved and continue to stay involved for many different reasons. And these reasons will vary between people and can change over time. So here is one outline of a conceptual model of how to organize thinking around science, citizen science under a particular definition. Again, I want to make it clear here that there are completely different taxonomies and this can really depend on your personal preference or institutional organization and definitions. So this is just one way of organizing citizen science that may or may not be how you conceptualize and organize citizen science. And uh, again, this, um, the, uh, this conceptual model was presented in a paper that is linked below um, where you can um, identify and um, see some of these concepts in much more depth. Um, and in this paper, the team organizes citizen science into long-running citizen science, citizen cyber science, and community science. So um, I will use these um, areas to describe some different types of citizen science now. So there are many examples of long-running citizen science some of which come from a lot long-standing birder communities. Uh, one example comes from 1880, when a teacher named Wells Wood Woodbridge Coke, who was living in the Mississippi Valley, began noting the arrival dates of migratory birds. And others joined him in collecting information on bird migration with support from American Ornithologist Union and the Observer Network expanded across the entire US Canada and, and um, other regions. For many years, the US government supported bird migration and distribution program, um, but that program uh, was closed around 1970. However, the North American Bird Phenology Program houses a data set of over 6 million historical observation of over 800 bird species. Um, and these document occurrences and migration from the 1880s through the 1970s. Um, and this is the longest comprehensive leg legacy data set on bird migration in existence. And um, the data is stored in a database which um, has been monitored and the program was revived in 2019 um, where nearly 1 million records have been described, transcribed. Citizen cyber science uses the computational and sensing power of billions of connected personal computing devices to be used as scientific instruments. So these can be from desktop computers, to game consoles, or more commonly now smartphones. Volunteered computing was first launched in 1999 when the study at home project uh, used the processing capacity of personal computers to send and receive data via the internet. However, this technique is not used much very, um, does not use much anymore. Um, volunteer thinking engages volunteers in a more active and cognitive level. In these projects, participants use a website in which information or an image is presented to them. They are provided with a little training in the task of classifying information after which they are exposed to information that has not been analyzed and are asked to carry out the classification work. This is commonly used in um, comparison with remote sensing data, data sets um, and ground-based information. And there are common platforms like Zooniverse or OpenStreetMaps that employ this technique. The final example of citizen, citizen cyber science is provided by passive sensing which participants either connect sensors to their computers or smartphones, or use built-in sensors that are now available in their devices to support the Earth observation efforts. Unlike participatory sensing, which we will encounter in the next session, section, the passive sensing is mostly based on automatic data um, without the conscious intervention of the volunteer. In this article's explanation of community science, the team described that there are that, that the primary differences 
is that the activities are initiated and driven by a group of participants and are more centered around addressing a particular community concern using scientific methods and tools. So here the participants develop the instruments, methodolo methodologies, and analyses. And particip participatory sensing requires really deep engagement with the community. There are many benefits to the use of citizen science observation in conjunction with satellite-based Earth observations. With expanded access to the internet and bandwidth, including scientific information, more people than ever can engage in these efforts. Engagement of thousands or millions of participants performing small tasks can be useful when comparing remote sensing data to ground observations over large spatial areas. This is particularly useful if participants are, use volunteer geographic information via GPS in smartphones, photo tagging, et cetera. Additionally, more and more sensors have been developed for smartphones, such as cameras, microphones, barometers, accelerometers, compasses, et cetera. And very importantly, citizen scientists can provide data where satellite EO data have gaps. These could include regions where it's difficult for the sensors to identify rain versus snow in mountainous regions, or providing critical information during emergencies when the temporal resolution is limited from satellites, where we often don't have an overpass in a particular region at the time scale needed. It's also important to note that when comparing ground-based data with satellite-based Earth observations, this often involves observing a variety of key variables. So these could be local information, sensor observation, human perception of events and phenomena. So now let's discuss some of the motivations, ethics, and policies of citizen science. As mentioned previously, it's important to consider the motivations of citizen scientists. This will assist in creating a respectful and mutually beneficial relationship for participants and researchers. The voluntary participation of citizens is implicit to the practice of citizen science. And this demands attention regarding motivation to engage and sustain engagement over time. So this could um, be in the form of financial, societal, or other forms of recognition. Citizen science implies elements of engagement in genuine scientific activity and education. In line with standard ethical practices, citizen scientists should be treated with respect and informed as to the purpose of their involvement. This will help ensure that they have been deliberately um, and sufficiently debriefed um, and involved with only non-harmful activities. So informed consent, is ensuring participants fully understand research objectives and data uses, and that there are continual opportunities for education. And citizen science should be allowed the option to opt in or out of correspondence, such as news alerts or events. Participants' informed consent and transparency regarding the storage and use of data are also important to mitigate against privacy concerns. Mutually beneficial projects ensure that participants' goals align with that of the project. It's also important to consider providing the opportunity for participant feedback during all of the steps of the project. You also want to consider what materials are necessary for the citizen science to be successful, and will those be provided? Things like a laptop, phone, camera, or any other kind of um, tools or materials. In order to fit the interests and abilities of a larger community, consider also providing multiple ways for citizen science to participate. So this could be part of data collection and processing or training and facilitating or social media and recruitment. Um, and then in cases where citizen scientists contribute substantially to the research, considering acknowledgement and publications, posters and more. And also giving the option to opt in or out of acknowledgement by the project team. There are also many things to consider related to policies and guidelines. 
All projects should include a terms of use agreement that informs participants of any risk that, that may be encountered. Um, NASA recommends projects use Creative Commons licenses, which grant individual citizen scientists the right to the data they submit to the project while permitting NASA to use it. Any project with submitted images should also include a media release form. Federally funded uh, projects must follow federal guidelines. So NASA follows the open data policy in which all data are shared with the public. These data are, include metadata, algorithms, source code, documentation, and data submitted by the, the citizen scientists. NASA also adheres to the private, to privacy policy which allows citizen science projects to use the data submitted for the stated purpose of the project. When citizen science projects include a mobile app, the app typically has additional privacy policies to protect against things like personal identifiable information or sensitive content. So um, we'll, you'll hear more about the um, NASA procedures in, in more depth in the next section. But with um, ethical consideration, privacy issues are especially important. And there are a range of data ownership and sharing challenges that um, need to be considered. Now let's discuss data collection, management, usability, and accessibility. While the engagement of large numbers of volunteers is always encouraging, Increased volumes of data do not necessarily imply the presence of more useful information. Data collected by citizens may lack metadata regarding their quality, which can often lead to scientific dis discrediting. So val validation mechanisms can also involve either the presence of geographical or domain expertise. Several initiatives rely on measuring instruments to provide their quality, precision, and accuracy, which can in turn indicate the validity of observations. It's important to consider formal participant training to assist in data quality assurance. There are many types of documentation standards, and these, again, can really vary from project to project. In can also vary across disciplines. Um, documentation for citizen science projects can contain data quality standards in terms of the sampling design, sample handling and custody, equipment maintenance, testing, inspection, and calibration, and ensuring that field and laboratory data undergo verification and validation. In terms of measurement protocols, these could include things like permitting, which is especially important if samples are being taken. The location of measurement and the data, um, ensuring that they're repeatable, ensuring that devices for measuring are calibrated and that samples are handed, handed, handled properly. And then finally, it's important when um, recording data that there are metadata. So these are things like date, time, location, identifier, coordinates, et cetera. Documentation standards include data archival and acknowledgement. As mentioned, metadata is very important. Um, the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, is a worldwide federation of national standard bodies. When thinking about geospatial information, metadata in the particular ISO protocol linked here is a really great guide. Um, proper file and data formats should be considered as well. For acknowledgement, there are a set of standards for which, for what level of effort warrants significant contribution. And so I've included uh, two useful resources here um, that center around um, addressing acknowledgement. Also, it's important to consider the usability of the project data. Who will be using the data and can they understand it? To enhance the usability of the project's data, um, the following should be regularly, regularly evaluated and updated throughout the project's lifespan. So things like metadata, who, what, when, where, why, um, and how. Data quality, uh, the quality of the data should be regularly assessed and maintained. Documentation, 
information discussed in the standard section of the presentation should be improved and modified to assist in citizen science understanding of the project. And then policy considerations. So what national or international policies are there when distributing data and code, and also thinking about ownership and licensing agreements. Some initial additional considerations are things like identifiers. So digital object identifiers that can be used to identify data for citation and distribution. Outreach, how to promote data usability through publications, newsletters, brochures, social media. Um, providing notifications, so a way for users to cite your data or sections of data. Providing things like a DOI or a data citation in your user guide or documentation. And then finally, data archival. So a plan for where the data will stay long term and in what format. There are also me multiple methods for preventing common sources of error in citizen science data collections. The best way to prevent error may be through smart capture mechanisms. For example, if you have a smartphone app, you have the location recorded with your GPS. You can also build in as much intelligence as possible into the app to reduce errors. Things like spell check, lookup lists, and AI-enabled does this make sense algorithms. You can also allow flexibility in data collection and allowing participants to include responses like, I'm not sure, or indicate their level of uncertainty. The scientists can also um, contribute to uh, data or correct their data after they have added it or even delete it if they don't feel confident in the data. Training and education is very important. Having documentation and trainings accessible to the citizen scientists during every phase of the project. So this could be in the form of a PDF, a recording, a video, et cetera. You can also provide a point of contact for questions or include an FAQ section in the app or the website. It's essential to ensure that the data from citizen science projects are available even after the project itself has ended. You can use community appropriate archives and distribute to community appropriate aggregators. For example, a project recording locations of birds may best be archived at data one, but the data should, could also be distributed to something like TBIF. Um, this is especially important when you consider future interoperability with other data sets. So for the data archiving process, it's important to plan ahead and think about what information and data needs to be preserved. So this is typically in the documentation, the metadata, and more. Considering file formats and the best way to apply the data. To enhance the discoverability, adding a DOI. In terms of the time frame for data accessibility, um, the data should be accessible to the public as soon as it's ready. Um, this may take longer for projects that require additional processing or evaluation. And then for long-term archiving, um, data can um, be fully archived at their final location after the end of the project. And all data should ultimately be archived permanently in an accessible and searchable location. Exceptions to this could include things like raw data that um, or data that generates privacy concerns. So now throughout this training we will be providing many examples of citizen science projects and tools and platforms. So here I'll just um, provide a bit of a teaser and highlight a few and I also want to make note that this is by no means a comprehensive list of all of the citizen science tools and platforms and resources available. Um, it's just a few of the notable ones that I have mentioned here. So the Federal Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Toolkit is a really great resource. It helps federal employees use crowdsourcing and citizen science in their work. It provides five basic processes for planning, designing, and carrying out a project. At each step, you'll find a list of tips 
you can use to keep your project on track. In addition to the tips, you will find case studies with success stories and some of the challenges that the project developers face. You can also find gateways to a range of other resources related to open innovation, challenges in private, prizes, and open government. Citizen science and crowdsourcing can help you engage in the public in the work beyond um, and, and collect data that may be on, beyond your reach. So I've included the link here to the um, toolkit uh, if you'd like to explore that more. SciStarter helps bring together millions of curious and concerned people in the world and provides thousands of opportunities to engage in these types of questions. It digitally connects and disseminates otherwise siloed citizen science activities and makes engagement trajectories explicitly visible in service to the public, organizers, and researchers. This also reveals patterns of engagement um, and provides the opportunity for deeper engagement across a large spectrum of uh, open science and citizen science environments. Um, so SciStarter works with many partners and funders to design, develop, pilot, test, iterate, evaluate, and scale programs uh, for a variety of different um, topic areas. So you can, again, follow this link for more information about SciStarter. And I also wanted to mention Zooniverse, which is the world's largest and most popular platform for this type of people-powered research. The goal here is to enable research that would not be possible otherwise. And Zooniverse uh, research results in new discoveries, new data sets, um, and many publications. So projects can use Zooniverse to combine contributions from many individual volunteers. Um, and you also have the ability to look at data and estimate how um, errors might be occurring, a variety of things like that. One particular project that we're going to highlight in session three called Snapshot Wisconsin um, uses Zooniverse in their work as well. So um, more to come on that. And then here are a couple of the other um, high level projects that have used Zooniverse as well. Um, so to summarize here from today's session, citizen science is a form of open collaboration in which individuals or organizations participate voluntarily in the scientific process in a variety of ways. There are many ways to categorize citizen science and, and different language to use, much of which depends on the type of project and the researchers and community members involved. Citizen scientists must be informed and properly trained, motivated, and respected throughout the process. Considerations must be given to data collection, management, usability, and accessibility. And there are many resources, tools, and platforms available for conducting citizen science projects. And we're really excited to highlight some additional projects um, that are coming out uh, around citizen science in the next two sessions. So based in our on our discussion today, here are a few resources. Please note that many of the figures and concepts articulated in this presentation have links to the articles and websites throughout the slides. So please use those as a reference as well. And we are going to now move into our question and answer portion. If you have further questions, you can contact myself or my colleagues. Our email addresses are listed here. As a reminder, you can visit the training webpage for all the materials, such as the, the PowerPoint presentation slides, the video, and also noting that the homework link will be available during the third session um, on the course website. So check back there. And um, we have also have many other RSET trainings, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, but do please check our RSET website for other topics you might be interested in or consult our sister programs, Develop and Severe, as well. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter to hear about upcoming trainings and exciting activities that we're engaged with. So thank you all so much. And we will now move to the Q&A portion.
We have the um, question and answer document up here um, right now. You can see it. I wanted to make note that after we address some of these questions, we will come um, and edit them and we'll eventually post all the question and answer, transcribed answers onto the course website um, as we, we move through the series as well. So um, if you missed a question or um, would like to reference some of the um, many references we often put on our Q&A document, you can always come back to that um, later on as well. We'll post it to the website. So um, for the first, uh, question. I'll just jump right in and um, feel free. Any of um, my the um, panelists that I mentioned, um, our guest speakers who are online with us today, feel free to jump in at any point um, with these questions as well. So the first is, how and where can citizen scientists publish non-academic research projects involving NASA's tool for public review, validation, and support? Um, so I've mentioned a few um, things here, and I would love to hear uh, from Stinger Guala, the program manager for Citizen Science for Earth Systems, on his thoughts on this as well. Um, we mentioned SciStarter and um, CitizenScience.gov. They both have areas on their website where um, project organizers can recruit um, for volunteers, and um, there are also forums where citizen scientists can connect to each other and share their information and data. Um, there's also a publication that um, is not peer reviewed, but um, is a really great resource called Earthseen, where um, we have, we used to have a lot of our um, NASA develop projects submit their work there, um, where it's a less rigorous, um, formal sort of process, but there are some really exciting um, uh, articles about um, Earth uh, observations and the use of, of data for um, these kinds of applications. Um, there's also uh, the Citizen Science Practice and Theory um, publication, although that is peer-reviewed. Um, and I've listed some of a, a list of the peer-reviewed publications where NASA citizen scientists have been co-authored on um, some of those um, articles as well. So oftentimes this, this is the um, citizen scientists working really closely with the um, scientists who are publishing the paper as well. Um, and then open to others, thoughts on ideas, um, potentially local community publications. There are some publications that reach out to um, high schoolers and allow them to publish their research in sort of a non-peer review um, location, but I would love to hear if any of our um, panelists online have other thoughts on, on this question. Hey, this is Stinger. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, Stinger. Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks for being here. Uh, sorry, I tried to open my camera uh, and I broke it. I'm that ugly. Uh, so the whole thing booted me out. Uh, anyway, so on this question, um, I'm not quite sure what the question means, but I would I would say that if you're doing uh, non-academic research projects, um, you know, the within the citizen science projects themselves, there are often uh, venues to publish data and to highlight data. And for example, uh, a lot of citizen science projects have, you know, observation of the month and things like that. And so, so those come up. And then there are also ways uh, where you can subset things as special projects within other uh, citizen science projects and then publicize those. Uh, for example, in iNaturalist, uh, you can make a community in there and then you can publicize that uh, on a Facebook page, things like that. But I think the most important thing is if you're going to have if you have a good citizen science project and there's attribution of the data, meaning, uh, you know, attribution of the person who actually took the observation and had anything else to do with the interpretation or anything like that, uh, then those kinds of things get republished in larger academic papers, things like that. And, and that's where the real gold of a lot of the citizen science that we work with is. 
And Great, thank we just, you. Yeah, we just need to be careful about making sure that everyone gets credit in those. Absolutely, good point. Um, this thank is, you so much. This is Katie up in Alaska, and um, I agree with Stinger on um, highlights and within projects newsletters we put out newsletters so that the the individual results or community level results are are put out there but also um creating opportunities for individuals in projects or groups in projects to present at um, conferences is a huge way for um you know a poster is so much less intimidating than a um than a peer reviewed publication. But you, when you go to someplace like AGU, which often has tracks for community science or for youth centered science, um, the, the, the citizen scientist gets public review um, and gets to engage with this larger scientific community. Uh, we also host symposia within our projects to provide that sort of atmosphere um, within, within our own um, state. So symposia, it's a great way. Thank you, thank you, Katie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's like Rusty. Yeah, this is Rusty. Hi, and I just wanted to reiterate that I was at AGU and I saw one of Katie's citizen scientists gave an incredibly powerful poster on the research that she's been conducting for several years. It started when she was a young person. Um, I just wanted to say also just to, to highlight, you know, once you find a project that you find scientifically valuable for your own research or if you want to connect people in doing citizen science once you find that project you know each one of us has different ways of outreach and you know Katie was talking about newsletters um, for the um, uh, Globe Observer program um, uh, with respect to the mosquito habitat mapper we have a website where we have blogs that we publish by our citizen scientists and our students that are um, collecting data and using data and these blogs very end, end up being sort of the first step towards an academic paper, some of which have been published in, um, you know, in referee journals. So um, I would, if you're interested in mosquitoes or land cover, I would really encourage you to go to Globe Mission Mosquito. It's a website, one of the NASA websites, and uh, look at the blog and see if this might be an interesting way for you to present. A uh, last thing, yes, we had a, uh, a, a citizen scientist in 2020 that made an outstanding observation in, in Madagascar. Um, it takes a few years for academics. Um, it's, you know, it's 2023 and the publication is being developed now, but we were able to reach back, find out who the citizen science team was that found that op observation, and they're going to be credited in that paper. So yeah, it, it's, it's we you know, we, citizen scientists really are treated like scientists in these programs, and there's lots of ways to share. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you, Rusty, and thanks, Katie and Stinger, for those um, suggestions. Really fantastic um, engagement opportunities and ways for citizen scientists to show the good work that they're doing. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, we have a few more questions, and um, I love this. Feel free, again, jump in. You all are the experts here. So the next question is, is social media information, such as Facebook, Twitter, used as a data source to integrate with EO data for citizen science integration? And uh, my initial thought was that those um, sources were mostly used as recruitment tools and that for many of the projects and some of the projects that we're highlighting throughout this training, the observations are actually being input into different applications or different websites that are specific to those, those projects. Um, but I would love to hear again from, from anyone um, online here about their um, uh, projects specifically and uh, engagement and interaction with um, social media. Hi, this is Rusty again, and I'll just say quickly, um, you know, uh, when you go and you scrape data from um, social media, very often that's called crowd sourcing uh, science because the mm -hmm. people may not be necessarily willing um, participants, which is a create, uh, which is really part of citizen science. Having said that, there was a um, one of the NASA Space Lab app winner, the winner for 2019, and one of those competitions that was talked about earlier was Project 80s. And what they did is they went in to social media, they scraped information um, from the web about um, people reporting cases of malaria, built that into an app, and then um, connected that to uh, NASA um, to remote sensing data. And our citizen science project now is um, in a 
in the process of collaborating with this project. So this is a really great question. And I think that when we talk about public participation in science, um, you know, I think with citizen science, we're talking about willing participants, but there's also a lot of data out there that is also available and useful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Rusty. So this is Stinger. Um, and I think that there are a number of super high profile examples of uh, you know, mining, uh, mining social media uh, for, you know, looking at scientific outcomes. You know, there are a lot of Twitter ones. In fact, I, uh, I used to have a slide in a presentation where I just mined Twitter because there's a great API for it. You can mine it. And I mined it for mentions of Bigfoot. And so I had the Bigfoot distribution in, in the U.S. <laughs> And it turns out that a lot of distribution data of things uh, in the U.S. is more correlated with population centers than anything else because, duh, there are more people there, you know. Um, and so that's what I was trying to show. And, and I, so those can be very useful, especially when you need large numbers of uh, observation points for some phenomenon that's readily capturable. But those, as Rusty uh, pointed out, those people are not consensual, uh, you know, So, and you also don't know who generated it. So it could have, as we know from recent press, it easily could have been a bot generating it. And so uh, you have to be very careful. And also, at least in the program that I oversee, uh, uh, Citizen Science for Earth Systems, we do not fund that kind of uh, crowdsourcing. Uh, because the participants are not uh, consensual and involved. And, you know, I think half of the good of citizen science is the engagement uh, aspect. You know, actually having people engaged in the scientific process and understanding more about the science, I think is, you know, that's a large part of the good that we do. And you don't have that with these non-consensual methods. Yeah, very good point. In in our project, the Fresh Eyes on Ice project here in Alaska, we um, uh, we conducted a a front end assessment to help guide the design of the program, which is a you know a really crucial step in meeting the needs of the community you're trying to serve. So in that project, you'll hear more about it later in the series. But we um, we share observations for community safety. And so making sure that the data is not just stuck in the globe database um, or in some project website was really important. And when we asked our participants in the front end assessment where they wanted to share observations, by far Facebook was the preferred location. Um, so we we have a grad student, right? We'll come up with a better system eventually, but right now we have a grad student who um, goes to the observations being shared intentionally and consensually on our um, on our Facebook group and we um, they ask written permit written permission to repost it to the database so that we have it geolocated uh, with the same sort of of um, quality and and um, uh, georeferencing that a, um, something submitted through an app would have so so there are ways to do it and it's very you know intentional and with consent and um, and and with it on Facebook, then people up in river and down river can um, learn from each other on 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 safe spots on the river. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, that's a great example of using the power of the social media tools, but then ensuring the consent and um, free uh, giving of information from the from the participants. So that's a great sort of. Um, combination of, of the benefits of those those types of tools and if, if folks are already using Facebook very consistently then that's a, a great place to go so thank you for that okay I think we'll uh, move on to the next question here and I think that the resounding answer to this will be yes and we'll have many examples but the question is do you have any success stories related to citizen science projects being implemented and how is it being sustained? Um, so yes, we um, that's going to be the primary focus for sessions two when we talk about uh, ocean and um, coastal applications and then session three where we talk about land applications. 
Um, but I'll open it up here if anyone would like to make a comment related to this question now. Uh, yeah, this is Stinger. So I've been doing this forever. Um, <laughs> so I've seen a lot of citizen science projects. And I just want to point out that, you know, it's not only sustainable, uh, there are citizen science projects that have become industries in themselves, and and they've transformed science. So, you know, it it's huge. Uh, I would think, uh, you know, I was I got in on the ground floor at the right time uh, with the virtual herbarium, which was my first citizen science project that I ever designed, um, and. Now they're virtual herbaria all over the world. There are thousands of them, maybe maybe tens of thousands, and and so they become, um, and they're not all citizen science projects, but I would say most of them are uh, getting the data. the The big one that comes to mind for me that really transformed things is eBird. You know that that is a gargantuan project. Uh, they I saw a graph a couple of years ago uh, from some initial funding, one grant, they had generated uh, about 30 times that amount of money in spinoff grants because the project was so successful. And if you look on, they used to give away, I don't know if they still do, but they used to give away prizes and, you know, coffee mugs and things if you had, you know, some number of observations and all that. And those things are just bringing insane amounts of money on eBay. You know, it's just that just shows you how pervasive in the culture uh, some of these citizen science projects have become. So, yes, there there are many, many, many success stories, and some of them are wildly successful. Great, thank you, Stinger. Yeah, and, and we'll we'll mention eBird in um, session three a bit more, but. Um, yeah, the birder community has this really long-standing uh, relationship with citizen science, and it's a great um, suggestion. Okay, any other thoughts on this? All right, for for question four, um, we'll move on here. The question is, can a citizen scientist engage in the analysis of data like quantitative, qualitative, or triangulation, or are they restricted only to data collection? Thoughts from our speakers here? This is Stinger. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of citizen science projects where the citizen scientists, uh, they do the analysis mm -hmm. uh, you know, of the data because sometimes it's uh you know in one way it's collection but if you're looking at photos and it requires a high level of interpretation a level that a computer can't do which is often the reason that you have citizen scientists looking at uh photos uh you know a lot of the work on zooniverse is is uh, focused on that uh you know that's that's a citizen scientist doing interpretation and analysis and then you know the next level up the accumulation i think a lot of uh a lot of larger projects have citizen scientists that move up through the ranks because it turns out if you spend piles and piles of time working with you know a certain kind of data you get really good at working with that kind of data so they end up being the best people uh, to hire to move up through the ranks and and do the actual analyses. Yeah, exa exactly. And I think we'll um, highlight many of the examples of the citizen scientists doing the analysis. Um, you know, Snapshot Wisconsin is a great example where they are actually classifying photos um, and feeding those classifications then into the broader um, you know, landscape metrics and things like that. And I think you'll see that over and over again where there are different levels of um, where the citizen scientists can not only collect data, but then engage in the, the analysis as well. Um, any other thoughts on this? 
Hi, Amber. This is Peter Nelson, and um, I want to I want to bring up the the idea of the data life cycle um, to this piece of it because it really is important to think about what that science process is. That you know, primary data collection is an expensive, challenging part of what science is doing. But remember, it is you you always want to have that opportunity to double check somebody's work, to research what somebody else has done. And um, and that is some of the transformation that has happened here in citizen science in particular is, you know, having open access to data so that um, people can see not only primary data collection, but they can do some analysis. They can they can answer their own questions that they might have um, by being able to access NASA remote sensing data coming from space. Um, and and so a lot of this is is really thinking about not only the the primary data collection piece, um, which sometimes is the fun part uh, for some people, uh, but then there's a whole lot of other people who can learn more about the process of science um, by repeating um, what other people have done. Um, and and sometimes that repeating of, of, of um, uh, code or processes or methods that other people have done really is part of that science process and that's where we can find errors or we can find that we need more data in, in other places um, and so you know a lot of a lot of citizen science projects you know uh, focus on that primary data collection piece but there is that whole data archiving where does the data go after the project is done how can it be combined with more authoritative data sets um, and you know the platforms in the internet have ha, is allowing us to take that other science step that previously you know we just couldn't do because we didn't have the technology and the ability so i just want to applaud all of the people that volunteer their time in the digital space as well as the physical space you know that make these things possible and as stinger highlighted you know a good idea gets replicated quite quickly out there Thank you, Peter. Yeah, uh, important point to think about the life cycle, the, the data. It's not um, it's not done when you um, just take the collection, right? There's a whole process involved there. So thank you for that. Thank you for being here. Um, the next question uh, refers to sort of uh, language around citizen science. And um, the question is, um, I recently heard citizen science being referred to as community science. Is this a newer concept or is it regional? I'm currently in Seattle. Um, panelists, thoughts on this question? Hi, this is Rusty. I'd love to address this because it is kind of an issue, especially for people like me who are working with international programs. And um, you know, the idea of citizen science, the term came out, I think it was in like in the early 1970s. The idea was being a citizen of the world and sharing science. Um, you know, with all the issues that we've had with immigration and um, you know, some of these other issues, particularly in the United States with undocumented individuals, the idea of citizen science has kind of sometimes taken on a little bit of a pejorative kind of uh, term. And so people are looking at other terms. The problem is community science has a little bit of a different tone to it than citizen science. Uh, citizen science generally means that there's a science project. Scientists have come up with a project and they have connected, they're connecting citizens connecting volunteers into it. Uh, community science, um, the, the official definition is that a community identifies a problem, initiates a project, maybe they bring in scientists, but it's community led. Um, the way that the Citizen Science Association is dealing with this is they're talking about it as C um, asterisk science, meaning community, community science, citizen science, collaborative science. Um, so, you know, I, this prop, the, the problem has not yet been um, completely uh, addressed. It's a linguistic issue, but uh, community science um, can mean the same thing depending on where you are right now. And so, you know, the problem with academics, they love to, I, you know, they love to make definitions. And so because there's a definition of community science that um, excludes a lot of citizen science projects, it, it hasn't been really taken over, um, but we'll see where we're going with this. So, but that's a really, really great question and thank you for it. So this is Stinger and um, as Rusty pointed out there, uh, 
there is some sensitivity with the term citizen in citizen science. And that's true, but it is what it is what is in some of the legislation that drives NASA uh, citizen science activities. Uh, it says citizen science, and so um, you know we have to stick to that uh, in some ways. And I'll also point out that you know having traveled quite a bit and uh, looked at thousands of uh, citizen science projects, there is an enormous diversity of uh, definitions of each of these terms. And everyone seems to be very sensitive about which definition they're using. So I'm not going to, uh, you know, proclaim that there's a right and a wrong definition, but I will say that you need to be careful when referring to these projects uh, and and respect the sensitivity within these groups because uh, there's there's a lot more complexity to this question than uh, than we can go into right now. Yeah, thank you, Rusty, and thank you, Stinger, for those perspectives. Yes. Okay. We'll move on. The next question um, is a little more specific on training. Um, the question is, can you provide a training on Python-based satellite image processing for Earth and area mapping? What about extraction and analysis of PAR, land surface temperature, gross primary productivity for carbon sequestration? Um, thank you for the suggestion on um, training topics. I, the, my initial thought is um, we welcome all of these ideas for training topics. Um, and it's something that we need to consider as a DARSET program as a whole and our portfolio of what we uh, deliver each year. Um, I will say we plan out our, our yearly trainings um, well, in it, well in advance. So um, if we were to do something along these lines, it, it wouldn't probably happen in the short term. Um, but we always take your suggestions into consideration as we're planning for the future. Um, I will say we, while we have not done Python-based processing for urban area mapping. We do have um, previous trainings on the use of some applications like um, um, for urban mapping. And uh, we also have trainings in the past on um, carbon monitoring and biodiversity applications that explain some of these uh, variables and processes. So we can link to some of those. Um, um, for general information, but they are not Python specific, um, where we have the advanced sort of um, coding aspects there. But I do thank you for, for that suggestion. Okay, um, now we'll move on to question seven. What are the criteria for selections, selection of citizens to choose for professional data gathering, et cetera? Um, thoughts from the panelists on this question? So this is Stinger, and I would say that uh, it varies by project. Uh, there are some things like uh, bird banding. If you're going to do that, that's an extensive training set uh, that you need, and you need to be certified to do that, and there are just all kinds of requirements. So, uh, you know, there's a certain kind of person that you want to choose to do that. Uh, and you can't train everyone. But that said, the most important thing, that the most general thing I would say is that you need, you really don't want to choose your citizen scientists. You want them to choose you and you want to make it as open and broad. Uh, you want to cast the broadest net possible. And that's not just because, you know, we should be as diverse as possible which is a huge driver. We should be as diverse as possible. But uh, like I mentioned with the Bigfoot distribution uh, that matches the distribution of lots of stuff, if you, uh, if you choose your people, then you're inherently biasing the data. And what you want is, you know, any statistician will tell you you want a random distribution. So you really don't want to choose citizen scientists unless unless there's some, you know, uh, overwhelming requirement that 
that you have to be careful about who participates. But what, what we really want to encourage is the broadest possible in uh, participation. And we want to make the recruitment process as broad and um, open as possible. Thank you, Stinger. Others? And and that is can be more challenging than you think. <laughs> With, um, you know, and I think that um, in the presentation earlier, it was highlighted that there's are, are a lot of barriers to entry, and I think that's why the field of citizen and community science has really shifted gears toward um, how do you make inclusive and um, diverse and um, equitable spaces within projects, and how do you design for that? When, you know, in, in 2006, when I designed my first citizen science project as a grad student, I was like, oh, how are we going to, how am I going to recruit people here in my town to participate? And I was like, how do I get my information? Oh, I listened to the ads on our local public radio station. I, I, uh, you know, and, and it wasn't, there was no surprise looking back that all the participants looked exactly like me. They were all like other grad students and other um, highly educated white women. And I was like, oh shoot, it, it, you know, you're thinking about how the entry points for that random distribution of participants is, um, has become the main focus of our work now. Yeah, it's a great point, Katie. And, you know, those barriers for entry, you have to be almost clairvoyant to understand them sometimes. A lot of times the simplest barrier to entry is people with free time, yeah. which means, yeah. you know, you're going you're gonna to be looking primarily at people who have free time, which is definitely biasing your data. And um, the... The front end assessment when you're designing designing a project, I see like down below there's some other uh, you know farmland use types questions like uh, a front end assessment can help you identify who are the key voices within that community that that um, can um, that should be included you know so and and then where do you where do they like to enter data or do all those um, farmland use type um, people involved you know involved in that topic area do they all use cell phones while they're out there maybe maybe not and so with the front end assessment you can really um, try to wash away your own preconceptions of that community and listen to them first great points thank you katie anyone else want to weigh in on this one Hi, Amber. This is Peter Nelson. And I, I want to say, you know, there's a big self-selection criteria uh, thing that happens, you know, before anybody even chooses to take part in a project. I know a lot of people who don't want to, they don't feel like they're good enough to participate in a NASA project, um, while other people get really excited about that affiliation and being able to do that. Um, and so, you know, there's kind of uh, the, that larger societal piece that that happens even before we get to talk to people sometimes about whether they see themselves as a scientist whether they know what that means whether we have whether we can actually describe what science is and how they are a scientist by just following directions and doing something a particular way um, there there is some of that self-selection that is happening before we even get to talk to them um, and 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 I think you know with, because we're here in a NASA session I just kind of want to highlight that sometimes it goes both ways um, it can be both that thing that attracts people um, because they want to affiliate because that's where the smart people work in their mind um, and then there's the other group who I get you know are intimidated by interacting with who they think are maybe people who are different than them um, but as we found out you know when they get to actually talk with a scientist they find out that in many cases they're much more down to earth or they they have you know similarities and things like that that um, we can help under we can help people understand what science is and how it can benefit everybody um, with this and so it's a hard thing when we think about who selects our projects because there is that that 
larger societal piece that we're trying to um, you know, deal with as well, which is who sees themselves as a scientist? Thank you, Peter. Yeah, great points from everyone there. Okay, I think we'll move on to the next question here. Um, and I think it's a pretty straightforward answer, but question eight is, can a citizen scientist be involved in more than one project simultaneously? Um, I think the answer is yes <laughs> for, um, for many of these projects, but I'd, I'd love to hear thoughts from the panelists on this too. So Amber, we know from the research that there's a lot of entry points and even a lot of duplication in citizen science um, activities out there. And so one of the things as a, you know, if you're if you're in charge of a project or um, something like that, sometimes you have to open yourself up to collaboration and recognize that it's okay if somebody sees themselves in another project, um, if they are, you know, doing similar science activities. Um, and in fact, it, what we find is that um, once people get into this community through, you know, maybe observing ice, you know, as one thing, or birds, they they see maybe these other opportunities that are available to them, and hopefully a larger. Uh, community of scientists who uh, and projects that that they can get involved in, and so that's been one of those things that that sometimes you know justifying um, why you're doing things is because you are providing a specific on ramp to a particular audience, um, and we would love to be everything to everybody, but I think it's 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 a reality that that it's okay to talk to a particular audience and bring them into the community and that that provides the diversity that we need. So this is Stinger. This is Stinger. And um, of course, <laughs> it's you You can just say it more than one. I do myself. Uh, and I have, you know, there are certain trends of participating in multiple uh, citizen science projects. One of them that's really prominent in my world is I have a lot of friends who use iNaturalist and they also use eBird. And so although you can put birds into iNaturalist and it's just fine at taking bird data, eBird's kind of better for it because you don't need a photograph of the bird and you can do sight lists in it. Uh, but iNat's better for everything else. So I see them out there with two apps and they've got their thumb set up on the phone. Oh, that's a bird. I'm going to eBird that, and there's a plant, I'm going to INAT that. Uh, you know, I see things like that happening all the time. It's not just in that world. That's a great point. Thank you, Stinger. Okay. Um, I think this next one's also for you, Stinger. <laughs> the question is, is this citizen science being funded by NASA? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> now there's so there are uh and i think we've already referenced the pages there are a lot of funding programs for citizen science at uh, nasa uh, earth science has ccesp but we also fund citizen sciences parts of other projects um and uh I think you're going to hear from a couple of those projects uh, that were funded outside of CSAS, NemoNet, and um, well, the, uh, the Soundscapes project was originally funded by Citizen Science and the uh, kind of research science group. And uh, it's just been, I think, amended uh, just by research. So, you know, these things. These things get funded in a couple of different places, it's, and it's important to recognize that. Uh, and then, of course, across NASA, uh, there's a there's the seed funding program, and there are pieces of uh, of other citizen science projects that get funded uh, widely across different programs at NASA. Yeah, thank you, Singer. Yeah, good to note there are a variety of avenues for this funding to take place. Um, and support these types of projects. Thank you. Okay, question 10. Um, 
love to hear from the panelists on this one. In your experience, what is the motivation for people to participate in data gathering, particularly XY coordinates? What should we bear in mind when trying to attract participation? Um, and this, this person is planning on gathering data for farmland use types. I think everybody could answer this uh, this question in different ways, uh, but I just want to say that you know when when the when during the presentation one of the slides talked about motivation, and um, this is a a really big deal because lots of people have the ability to collect this data. Um, for people to do it more than once is um, always a challenge. We call this nibble and drop. Uh, Heather uh, Fisher wrote a paper about this in the Citizen Science Association Journal. Um, but you know, if if people, for instance, are people that know that their data is going to help them in their agricultural practice or in land use planning or, or whatever the the thing is, as long as they see that there is something of interest to them intellectually, of something might, which might be interest to them eventually economically or something that can help them in their day-to-day -day life that's the most powerful motivation i think we know about so with mosquito habitat mapper for instance boy we get tremendous participation when there is a dengue outbreak in brazil or there's a malaria outbreak in madagascar uh, because they know their data is going to be useful and it's going to help others so I'm going to drop that there because there are other answers to that. But I think reaching out to those people connected with those communities is going to be the most important strategy, in my opinion. Thanks. Thank you, Rusty. Other stuff? Uh, sorry. This is Stinger. Uh, I've got, you know, uh, I mean, of the many citizen science projects I've worked with, I see there's some general trends in motivation. And as Rusty pointed out, being part of a bigger whole and you're gonna help people, that's a huge one. And uh, a lot of people are really inspired by that. But they're also, and I see this more in some communities than others. Uh, you know, I grew up in the antique business and we dealt with collectors all the time and they just had to have every individual variation on some, kind of China or something, and the bird people are no different. They have to have one of every species in their life list. And uh, orchid people are exactly the same. They want one of everything. And there's a huge motivation within the citizen science, within a lot of citizen scientists uh, to be, you know, just to, to own their own space and be the expert uh, on that or be the person who surveyed my county for this um you know and you can do that in citizen science projects because it's self-driven you know it's uh that's another important motivator uh for citizen science the other the other motivator i see is just learning about the environment uh there's a there's a huge motivation just you know getting out and uh, learning about whatever subject you're interested in, a citizen science project is a fabulous way to do that in many ways. Thank you, Stinger. The addiction hey, factor is real. I, I uh, my husband's addicted to <laughs> naturalist, much like Stinger is, and um, I, I'm addicted to Peter's project, Land Cover. And when I miss a, a photo op for Land Cover, I'm almost to my hundredth observation, Peter. There's an addiction factor and um, like figuring out ways to help fuel the addiction of like badging or, um, you know, the in, in iNaturalist, the real time interactions with other people who love the species that you love, you know, all that kind of fuels this addiction <laughs> to keep people going. It's true. Katie, thanks for bringing up that land cover piece because farmland is one of those things, right? And um, and 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 I think you know one of the things is I think about something that you know it it, it can easily go into people's background. Yeah, um, you know they see it all the time. They don't think it's novel. Why am I collecting this information? Um, oh, somebody else is going to do it. Um, sometimes come across if you don't make it clear why you're asking them to collect information about what you're doing, right? Um, and in this case, I think that that again goes back to what everybody has talked about is like, what is the motivation? Why is this a scientific question? Or why is this a, a, a reason why people should spend their time, even if it's five minutes, 
um, doing something to help you. Um, and and I think it, what I found in my experience kind of dealing with land cover and something that everybody's in every day, um, but it, it, it takes somebody to show them the world in, in, with new eyes sometimes to get them to go, ah, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's why I should spend my five minutes doing that. And, um, and when you can make that connection, you get people like Katie who will advocate for you and will then, you know, get other people motivated to do it because, you know, that's, that's the infectiousness that comes from um, highly motivated people, um, whether they be scientists at NASA who spend a lot of time doing particular things or whether they're people out in the community, um, you know, helping to reveal the world in new ways, I think is a way that you can really increase that novelty to something that people are used to seeing and may not think is a really important piece of information. Oh, I know what happened over there to that farmland. Why do you need that information? So again, it kind of goes back to us as scientists who are designing this to be very clear about our hypothesis, why we're doing what we're doing, and finding the right way, as Katie highlighted, to talk to the community that you know you're trying to address with that question. Land cover. It's everywhere. Great, thank you. Yeah. Peter. I think that local component's important uh, as well. You know, that can be a big motivator. I had in the virtual herbarium when we started that, I had all of these specimens from Panama and I couldn't, you know, they're all handwritten labels and they're all places that I couldn't find on maps. And we're trying to digitize the labels. And I thought, you know, this is on the internet. Maybe we could get people in Panama to do this. So we got people in the local communities where this stuff was collected, and they knew so much more than we could ever find out about what they were reading on the label. You know, I didn't know where Mrs. Lopez's farm was. You know, I had no idea. But they could ask their grandmother and find out where Mrs. Lopez's farm was. It was just amazing the amount of information we got. And then they were so excited because they were the world experts on those specimens, uh, unquestionably. Great, thank you, Stinger. All right, uh, I recognize we have one minute left um, and we have many more questions. Um, so we'll get to these as, as possible. Um, the, the next question really briefly, um, asked about, is it possible to propose an existing project to NASA's DEVELOP program? And we've provided a link there um, where um, I believe there's a form to fill out for ideas for projects. Um, and my colleague Juan here is one of the mentors of the DEVELOP program. Juan, is there anything else you'd like to add there? Yeah, Amber, thanks. Yeah, uh, just uh, if, if they have a, if someone has a, a particular idea about a developed project, feel free to communicate with me through the email that it's uh, on the on our <clears throat> on our presentation. And, uh, and one thing to keep in mind is that uh, that developed projects are really fast-paced uh, projects. They're ten weeks, so it should be an idea of a of a project that can be conducted in the in such a short amount of time but uh but yes uh, who, uh the person who made this this particular question feel free to, to email me and uh and we can follow up on that thank you Juan. great well i recognize we're we're at time and i really want to thank all of our panelists online with us for this really engaging question and answer session it was so great to have you and your perspectives um, as you are the experts and the, the folks really doing this, this good, important work. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, stay tuned for our next two sessions. So we'll hear about ocean and coastal applications on Thursday. Um, and then we'll hear about land applications next Tuesday, a week from today. So you can um, learn more about of, of all of these projects and um, and be with us for those. So thank you everyone from around the world um, who are with us today and we're excited to continue um, this training um, series and to be with you in the future. So do take care and we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you.